All right, we can go ahead and start. There may still be a few people wandering in. Um, welcome to our panel. Um, protecting user rights, practical issues for early stage companies. Uh, we've got, we may still have people wandering in, but we can go ahead with some early introductions. Um, and then our goal today is to have a very active conversation, um, to hear your questions, your thoughts. Uh, if you work for an early stage company, what challenges you're facing, if you are aware of challenges facing early stage companies, uh, what you're seeing out there, and um, what resources may be available. Um, can you, actually, I'd love to get a sense of who is in the room. Are there people here who do work for companies? Perfect. How about um, advocacy organizations? <laughs> uh, academics? I think you've raised your hand for every one of them. You are all purposely audience member. <laughs> uh, other organizations that people work for? Just to get a sense of who's here. So it's a little a little practitioner, but I used to be at Creative Commons and the same law technology company. So, so. Well, good. Uh, we definitely, throughout the panel, would encourage you to raise your hand, throw out questions. You know, we're going to try and keep any prepared remarks quite brief. We um, really want to have a discussion about um, these issues because one of the things, you know, the issues we're talking about at the conference overall at RightsCon, key questions of user rights related to freedom of expression and privacy. These are not isolated to large companies, to older, more established companies. Um, your very early stage company can be facing significant uh, concerns um, related to both privacy, freedom of expression, and other rights, and frequently may be operating uh, in, with resource constraints, um, you know, personnel, funding, um, a whole host of challenges in terms of how to manage these issues. And I think there's a, currently a dearth of guidance out there for younger stage companies on how to manage these issues. And that's something that a few of us have working to address. Just an introduction to myself. Uh, my name is Sarah Altschuler. Uh, I work for the law firm Foley Coag in the corporate social responsibility practice. For, we've been working with the Berkman Center, and I'll allow Diane from the Berkman Center to introduce herself um, on a guide for young companies. And we have sort of a preview versions and excerpts from the guide in draft form uh, if you want to take a copy on the way out and an email address to contact us if you're interested in finding further information later. But uh, today, I think what we want to do is sort of get some perspective from our panelists, and I'll you know, introduce who we have here. Uh, and again, get that active Q&A going, um, just to really have a conversation about what some of the challenges are. I'm not going to introduce uh, full bios. I want them to really give their own introductions in terms of um, where they work, et cetera. But we have Dai uh, from the Berkman Center at Harvard University, Bella from Yahoo, uh, Jane from uh, Endurance International Group, and Vivek, who's a colleague of mine at Philly Hillac. And with that, I'm actually just turn to the panel, and Dahlia's going to kick us off. Um, so I'm Dahlia Topolson. I'm a clinical instructor at the Cyber Law Clinic that's situated at Harvard Law School in the Berkman Center for Internet and Society. That's a mouthful. Um, and uh, I, my clients range everything from advocacy organizations to tiny little startups who are grappling with these types of issues. So thinking about, you know, there's, they've created some excellent, very interesting new technology and have no sense about privacy, intellectual property, anything. And uh, we help guide them and try to lead them in the right direction. And we notice that there is a gap in understanding and a very steep learning curve, and particularly when you start getting to the, you know, level where you're thinking about human and civil liberties, and they're also thinking about venture capitalists, and they're getting information and guidance, and frankly, requests from venture capitalists that may not align with some of the interests of their core customer base that they're trying to target. We realize it would be good to arm them with a little bit more information to help them answer these questions in a way that can situate them a little bit better in the marketplace. So down the line, when they do blow up, suddenly they're not facing some huge PR scandal or you know really you know frankly learning from the mistakes of some of the larger companies that unfortunately had to bear these processes in a, in a more hazard way early on and. Um, also understanding that they don't have access to someone like Bella to be thinking about these 
issues day in and day out at a company, they may not even have access to an attorney, period, or any or a policy person, period. So, um, you know, the challenges are the same for a small company as well as a big company. Small companies making the wrong decision can put them out of business, period. Users can flock to something else. Um, it's a fast-paced, fast-moving environment. And I think consumers are becoming a little bit more savvy in light of, you know, not only the Snowden revelations, but also security breaches. Um, you know, it's interesting how the analog world and the digital world are starting to come together. Everyone thinks it was Target.com that got compromised, but it was actually their physical stores systems, and that's just a learning process that I think consumers just weren't aware that they were already giving a ton of data to companies even outside of the online world. And so um, our guide and kind of what we're trying to address is really provide very high level, not replacing actual guidance <coughs> for a specific company and going to their own attorneys, but at least giving them a starting point to think about what questions to ask, to know that these are elements that they may want to thread through out their um, organization in the very, very early stages or even mid-stages. Um, so that's kind of the goal of the guide and, and what we've been thinking about at the Berkman Center. Um, so. Jane, do you want to uh, go next since we can again introduce um, who you are in your company but also the challenges that you see? Yeah, sure. Um, so I am Jane, um, and I am Assistant General Counsel for a company called the Endurance International Group, which is based um, in Boston. And it is a company that provides cloud-based solutions for small businesses. So um, our core services are web hosting and domain name registration, as well as website open tools. So everything that you would need to get online. Um, most of our customers are very small businesses with 10 or fewer employees. And um, we have customers all over the world. We have operations in India and Brazil as well as the US. Endurance itself is not a consumer facing brand. So if you haven't heard of Endurance, you may have heard of Skater or Bluehost, um, which are a couple of our larger brands, as well as Reseller Club and Dark Dime, which we recently acquired in India. Um, so as assistant general counsel there, um, Endurance, so Endurance was a former startup and we just went public in October of last year. So we have what my boss likes to call a small but quality legal team, <laughs> which means it, he was the only one there for about 10 years. I joined about two and a half years ago and now we have two corporate lawyers devoted to the securities regulation side of things. Um, and I mention that because that means that as um, somebody who heads up legal support for all aspects of the company's business. I deal with a very wide range of issues from intellectual property to litigation to customer support, including issues like user rights, um, marketing and branding, compliance with economic sanctions, regulations, international operations. So there's no way that I can be in this <laughs> and in every single one of those areas. But that being said, I do have a special interest in invited to join this, this panel and talk about it. Um, so Endurance has about then about three and a half million subscribers on its platform, which is nowhere near the size of Yahoo's yeah, customer base, I'm sure. But it still means a lot of customer websites and a lot of user-generated content, which um, provides us with a consistent flow of support issues ranging from allegations of copyright trademark infringement by our customers to, to um, allegations of defamation <coughs> or ownership disputes, um, a, a wide ranging of, of matters. And the challenge is for us to be able to deal with them in a consistent and objective way um, and to have policies that's clear and easy for support staff to follow. Uh, there's just no way with three and a half million customers that lawyers can review every single one of those requests that we get on a daily basis. So we try to really operationalize our policies and procedures and then make sure that there is a speedy escalation path. So 
anything that um, the hard cases get brought up to us quickly and then we can talk about them. Um, I think the other difficult um, thing that I face is the internet being borderless um, as another layer of complexity. I think. So we get not only complaints and uh, law enforcement requests from the United States but from other countries as well. And so it's a constant struggle to try to figure out which other countries' laws apply to us. Um, is it enough that our customers there or the complainant is there? Or does it require that if our servers are there and we have operations there, that's sort of an easier, um, easier way for us to determine that, okay, we should abide by the laws of that country. So, you know, we're thinking now about having regional policies with a big shop company like that we would people have and we're not quite there yet. Um, and I, I guess I think that these practical issues are really important for early stage companies and, and even policy folks to think about because I think that the detail, the devil is in the details and you don't always have um, the benefit of um, 2020 hindsight. So when you're faced with a request to take down um, customer data, you're, you're often dealing with imperfect information. Um, there's two sides to every story. You only get snippets. Um, so, you know, again, yeah, it, it's a challenge to, to apply things consistently. And I think there's been some talk about the terms of service of internet companies um, and internet service providers being more prescriptive than what is required under the law. Um, and I'd just like to say that I think there's two reasons for that, at, at least from our perspective. One is we need to protect the integrity and stability of our platform. Um, so we host millions of websites and we're a shared hosting service. So if one site gets attacked, that can affect a number of, of other customers. And so we need to have the tools to prevent DDoS attacks and other cybersecurity um, threats. And the second is that I think that the law hasn't kept up with technology. Um, so there are a number of cases where we look to the law, but it doesn't really give us the information we need. So there's some talk that and lab process is really cumbersome and slow, and you know it's a lot easier for people to come to companies directly to take action. Um, say, uh, I've been following some of the recent articles about harassment of, of women online, and if local law enforcement doesn't act, well, it's a lot, a lot easier for them to put pressure on Twitter to, to take stuff down. Um, so these are sort of all of the issues that, that I see and that I deal with on, on a daily basis and that we think about. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, Abella, do you want to Give your perspective again a sort of a more established company, but certainly a lot of lessons along the way. Uh, gosh, so much. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so my name is Abella Kobe. I'm uh, the uh, head of the global head of human rights at Yahoo. Um, and my department really grew out of lessons learned um, in China. And those lessons learned not just by Yahoo, but by, I, I would say, the industry at large. I think when we began, certainly when Yahoo began as a company, and certainly there was no there was no conception that human rights intersected so directly with our business. And so the benefit um, of the benefit of learning the lesson that way is that at Yahoo there is a, a deep understanding of where our business intersects with human rights. And I will say that the intersection is growing broader and broader. I mean, as the years go by, um, there there's this huge body um, um, of, of, of instances where, that demonstrate what, what our vulnerabilities are as a company. Um, I think what's interesting about this, and often in settings like this, we don't talk about it, um, because there's this conversation about you know, companies resisting law enforcement, but the, the difficulty of this, and I think this is one of the things that makes it very unique to our sector, are a couple of things. One, that as a, I can speak for Yahoo, and I think this is true of many other companies, in many ways, when it comes to privacy and free expression, our interests are aligned with the consumer. So it's not like, you know, if you're talking about, you know, extractive industries, or we're, we're in an extractive industry if we have a village that's at the side of an oil refinery. It is in the company's interest to extract oil there, and it's in the villagers' interest for that to. In this case, it is in our interest to have as much on our platform as possible, because the more information you have, the more users you have. In this instance, it's, it is in our interest for, for users to trust us. It is not in our interest 
to, to serve as an arm of law enforcement in any country. I mean, putting aside the, 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 the moral um, and ethical ramifications of it, just as a process issue, um, it, it costs us a huge amount of money and resources to be in a position of, of accepting law enforcement requests. The other piece, and this is, this is the part that I think doesn't get talked about enough in these gatherings, is that there is a human rights interest in having, you want companies to be corporates, uh, to be good corporate citizens. There is a human rights interest in having platforms where people cannot use your platform or your product to commit crimes. You do not want, um, and I think the example that you're talking about in terms of women being harassed, you do not want vulnerable communities um, to be victimized by the internet. So that puts companies in a position of, and then the other piece, overlying piece, is that companies are subject to the law. You do not want in a CSR, in, a, in, a, in an environment, um, uh, in a sort of an international, global context, you do not want companies deciding for themselves. You know, I'm just, you know, I'm a Chinese company, I'm, I'm in the US, I don't, I'm, I'm not really digging this US law, I'm gonna decide for myself what law, I, you don't want that. So if you think, and I think rule of law is critically important. So if you put all of these together and then think about the fact that companies are operating in a global context, so you can call, and I think this is what is interesting uh, for new companies. When we started at Yahoo, there wasn't this, I, I think we had a much longer runway. Mm -hmm. Now you, you'll be a startup and you'll have one person and you'll turn your thing on and all of a sudden you have a user in Iran. You have, you have not marketed for that user in Iran, you have not asked that user in Iran, but now you have all of the issues that attach themselves to having a user in Iran and that was very different. So, so, so I think the, the, the possibility for companies to run up against very complex rule of law, human rights issues starts very, very early. Um, and I think recognizing that these are complicated issues is very, very important and leads to much more informed conversations. So in terms of lessons learned, we've learned, I mean, we've learned and continue to learn so many. One is that it will happen to you. So you're a new company, you think, well, you know, Yahoo did all that stuff in China. We would never. <laughs> it will happen to you. It may not be that, but it will be something. So, to the, so, so, which leads to my second point, which is, um, we have helped you. I mean, and by we, I mean a vast majority of older companies, like old man companies. <laughs> we have helped you, and we've made a, a number of different mistakes. And so, look, look, and see, learn from those mistakes. And so, that's the. So, we have a lot of conversations with um, with newer companies, thinking about, well, this, you know, this is what happened here at our company. These are ways to do it a little bit better. Um, one of the other lessons learned is that um, if you don't have a senior level understanding of what your vulner vulnerabilities are, what your risk factors are, you will not be in a position to address them. So it's not something, even if, if you're a one person show or if you're a five person show, it's very helpful to have all of those five people understand your human rights risks um, and, be, and, and be aware of how to address them. Um, it, to the extent that it lives only in one department or only with one person, you know, you have a business person doing deals who's completely uninformed, and they'll come to you and say, hey, I've got X and X, and X and X is a totally bad thing, and they don't know this because they, they, they haven't been informed in the way that they should. Um, I think the other, um, you know, I'm going to stop there because oh, I know you know this, but, but though I would say that um, based upon our experience and based upon the being an older company in this sector, those are the those are the issues that we face. Oh, and also that the issues continue to evolve, yeah. and it's very difficult to know in a, in advance what they are. And so I would say being part of organizations and being connected to a multi-stakeholder group of people. One of the things that we really benefited from at Yahoo is being a member of the Global Network Initiative, which has NGOs, has academics. I mean, it's how I've met all of my friends at work. Um, and, 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 and really, um, talking to the people who hate you are, is very important. So I think one of the things we learned at Yahoo is that some of our fiercest critics from around 2007, 2006, 2008 are now our most um, trusted advisors. So engaging with people who can teach you about how to do your business better um, has been critically important. We've done that through the Global Network Work Initiative, um, but would really encourage people to reach out, um, not just to, but to companies, I think companies are important, but also reaching out to people like Dahlia, reaching out to people at a number of NGOs, because we've learned so much from talking with them to, to different types of stakeholders. So shout mm -hmm. out to Helen, you. Lots of questions, but I'll follow up after. I'd uh, like uh, <laughs> uh, to offer these from external advisors. Sure, I'll put it on my. Uh, 
law firm slash CSR hat, and um, you know, just provide some of our perspective. As, and, and the guy that we're developing is trying to help early stage companies work their way through some of these issues. I think uh, as a first point, sitting in, in, in my chair as a lawyer, I think these questions are hard. And they're hard for a whole bunch of reasons. I, our guide focuses on the interaction between user rights and US federal law. And that itself has taken us, you know, a year to prepare and figure <laughs> out, you know, what do we say, what kind of advice we put. And, you know, just in the United States, there's 50 state laws, and then there's 200 countries out there, where, as uh, Bella pointed out, that, you know, your product is going to be used in those countries, like it or not, right? It's on the internet, it's a global internet. And, and grappling with that jurisdictional complexity is really hard. It's hard for Google or Yahoo, and it's infinitely harder for, for a startup, right? Um, but at the same time, the risks are higher uh, and greater than they ever are before as we see more and more people in places where freedom of expression and privacy are really not respected uh, going online and using these tools to express themselves and engage in risky activity, right? Uh, politically risky activity, kind of things that governments don't like. And we see that right now in Ukraine, right? It's a prime example of this. Uh, we saw it in the Arab Spring. Uh, as to how technologies get used by activists, get abused by governments um, in these kinds of situations. Um, so the risks are high, and the reputational damage, once it's done, is very hard to undo. And this is not just true in the ICT space, right? I mean, we see this with you know, companies like Nike and Shell, uh, Shell less than Nike, having proved uh, that their record over time or, I mean, as, as Abel said, you know, Yahoo has really assumed a, a position of leadership after what happened in China. We're still here discussing Yahoo, which is kind of unfortunate, right? I think, you know, the company, Yahoo's been exemplary moving forward, but that's really hard to overcome. And as an early stage company, I think it's what Dalia said, right? Those decisions um, have great salience. And I, one of the, the, the figures in, in, the, in the plenary session this morning that really struck me was that this, uh, Apparently, WhatsApp has lost 30% of its users in the Netherlands since Facebook bought them. And I mean, they haven't done anything, right, other than get acquired by Facebook. Uh, and, and, you know, some of the baggage that Facebook carries uh, on privacy has instantly infected uh, the startup. So that's all very hard. Um, that's the negative side. On the positive side, I think the flip side is that an early stage company is nimble. Right, because you don't have this accumulated history reputationally, or you don't have a code base, right? You're still working it out. And one of the key themes um, that we try to uh, develop in our guide is this idea of you know sitting there at the beginning and thinking about what the use cases are um, of your your product and architecting that product in a way that is protective of your users. Because if you start out on uh, the right foot, right? That's much easier than trying to fix things in the back end. And that applies on policy too, right? I think having a few policies and procedures and giving a little bit of thought as to what you do when you know your domestic government asks for something or foreign government asks for something uh, really helps guide that response because one of the most dangerous things for any kind of company is the ad hocery that happens when someone does knock on the door, right? Because you haven't thought through what the risks are, what the uh, implications are of your response, right? And that's how companies get into trouble. And one of the things we were trying to do is to provide that guide in the beginning, before you have the public policy person, before you have the legal person, or you know, when you have over overwhelmed people who are overwhelmed because their one role encompasses many different things, um, to help guide some of that. Um, in a similar vein, I think values are also really important. Um, I think a lot of startups do have core values as to what they're, what they're trying to do, right? Um, a lot of startups are, are very kind of community focused in trying to create a product that really improves human experience and human communication, right? And having, when you don't have a policy, uh, you can always fall back on your values to try to help to guide that response. And I think companies that do have a strong identity of what they're doing and why. I was struck yesterday by uh, some of the discussion, um, the gentleman from, from Evernote who talked about you know what their 
idea was, and even though they didn't have formal policies and procedures until 2011, um, that really helped define what they're doing. And uh, just to pick up on Abella's point, I think engaging with those people who are going to be your critics, um, who are going to be the users who are going to face the greatest challenges, can be really, really helpful in helping uh, a company think, a young company think through where the risks are and how best to, to uh, deal with them. And without undercutting me too much, they're much cheaper than our <laughs> advice. So uh, it's, a, <laughs> it's a great way of, of feeling out some of the issues at an early stage in dealing with them. And okay, I just, just to add on to that, and part of this is threading it into the business model and business plan as well. So thinking about what can you do with the resources you have today and where would you want to grow? And it helps plan for resources down the line as you need to establish a deeper bent and also identifying external resources that can help you to create that deeper bent when you are literally a team of one to five or even a team of 20 to 50. And we should take Yeah, no, I want us to open up to the floor. Well, so I, I actually wanted to um, elaborate on a point that Vivek made because um, architecture, I think, is the beginning, be all, end all, where you start. And Abele, I know you weren't there when we had our, I used to be at Yahoo, I used to oversee international law enforcement at Yahoo oh. during our China incident. Wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I have a lot of firsthand experience yeah, in this yeah. area, yeah. Uh, given that was my team that, you know, I mean, so it was the architecture um, that was the be all end all. Yahoo was the first internet service provider that actually was in China and licensed to do business in China with staff on the ground. And it's one thing to say, you know, if you're a startup and you're sitting safely behind US borders and your Twitter the way Twitter was, you know, five years ago, um, China says, turn over data, you can say ha 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 behind US borders and US courts won't enforce your judgment. When you've got staff on the ground in China, mm -hmm. servers on the ground in China, you have to comply with the law of China, whether you like it or not. And that is something that companies need to think about very early on. Now Yahoo knew that when it put servers on the ground in China, that it ran the risk that this is exactly what might happen, and they chose to encounter the risk. And I don't think anybody realized quite how extensive the fallout might be. Uh, they knew it was a possibility. I don't think they thought it would play out quite so dramatically, but helping clients see very early on, okay, do you have the type of platform where people are gonna be using your services to express controversial ideas? So for example, I'm at Adobe Systems now, and we, um, about a year and a half ago, acquired a company called Behance, which is the single largest um, artist portfolio website in the world. And our single largest growing source of users are users in China. So do you host it in China or do you keep it stored offshore? You know, if you can offshore it and you don't get caught up in the firewall, then when you get an order that's not, you know, free speech friendly or not user friendly, it's not enforceable against that particular unit. And so thinking out those corporate structures, thinking out that architecture, in advance is so critical because it was that same decision about putting servers in China or putting servers in France. It made Yahoo the hero in France mm -hmm. over, you know, when they were fighting re regarding Nazi-related content, they could say, the France site will comply with French law, but the US site won't because the US site was outside of the jurisdictional reach of France. But the, all of those decisions are made the very second you decide your network architecture. It's not decisions later on down the road. Yep. And I need to rate on that particular parade because those those are all true and I know that one of the things that we need to do human rights is that we think very carefully about working with data and working with people. What's interesting is that governments are becoming much more savvy about that and they are asserting jurisdiction whether you're there or not. So our favorite case is, um, and it, it's still ongoing, Belgium, which you wouldn't think of as, to extent you think of Belgium, you think of, I don't know. Fries <laughs> 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 or Brussels, but you wouldn't think you don't think of Belgium as like as, as a country that, that goes against human rights. But in any case, we got a law enforcement request from Belgium. So we don't have it was for data that was in Yahoo um, U.S. And so the way um, Yahoo is architected now is that we have only respond to law enforcement requests if those requests are from the particular jurisdiction that we have um, uh, put those terms of service under. So it's for a Yahoo Inc. user, US user. We don't care where you are in the world. You signed up under a US TOS. And so the, the Belgian government asked us for data. And we said, look, it's for a US user. If you want it, go through the US MLAT process. 
as you've mentioned, the MLAP process is very clunky. Belgium didn't want to do it, and so they threw a huge effort, and they sued, and we, and we lost. I mean, we, we appealed, and we lost, and we appealed, and we lost. And, that, and they said, we don't care how you've organized your company. We don't care that there is no young, we don't even have a young Belgium. We have nobody on the ground in Belgium. But they said, the crime that we are seeking to address happened in Belgium. And so we think that you have a responsibility as a company, and we assert jurisdiction over you. And so all of these, th these things are important, and we've certainly made decisions like that. So for example, we have Vietnamese language services. We host data outside of Viet Vietnam. We put it under, we don't put it under Vietnamese language talks, and for now it's worked. <coughs> to recognize as a company is the strategies that you come up with um, may or may, I mean, they may work in the short term, but they may, and so you have to always be thinking. And I think the flip side of that, and one thing that I always want companies and advocates to remember, um, is that crimes happen in those countries. So if you are in Saudi Arabia, so for example, we have Yahoo Maktou. Yahoo Maktou is a, uh, we, we purchased Maktou used to be the Yahoo of the Middle East, and now it actually is the Yahoo of the Middle, of the Middle East. And we made a very deliberate decision about where we host data. We made a very deliberate decision about the terms of service. So anything for user content is under US law. So no, no, there are no jurisdictions throughout the Middle East who we would say have, uh, have um, the, the, the authority to request data. However, um, beca uh, because of what, uh, what countries can, can decide to do, they can, they can say, well, you know, a crime can happen in Saudi Arabia. So even though we say we don't, <coughs> we don't sub subject ourselves to, to jurisdiction in Saudi Arabia, people get raped in Saudi Arabia, people get killed in Saudi Arabia. So what does it mean for human rights if we as a company are saying, look, we can't hand over data. Now there's a reason we do it, and it's because it, it, it's aligned with all the decisions we make around human rights. But think about what the actual real life impact of that can be mm -hmm. um, to people on the ground. So, and I say this just to say there are often no easy decisions. And so I think the point about values is a really important one. So figuring out sort of what's important to you as a company, and being able to say this is why you made that decision, because you will never make everyone happy. And so I think being very clear about why you made a decision and then understanding that as circumstances change, you may have to change your decision based upon changes in circumstance. One of the things that's come up, I mean, thoughtful architecture I think is incredibly important, but there's a huge lack of awareness from a small company perspective about where you can put servers or where you can put data. And I think that there's, I mean, one of the things I'm really curious about from players like Yahoo or players like Google have done a lot of the survey research is how much of that legal research you can be interested in making public, mm -hmm. just so much as it, it helps other companies figure out this is a terrible place to put data, this is a decent place to put data. I mean, so, so a couple things, I think through GNI, and I had mentioned it before, it's, it, that has been a great way to share information related to human rights, and I think it has also been helpful to have engage with people on the ground, particularly NGOs who can talk about that. I will say, and I hate to continue being the bearer of bad news, that there are countries that people said, these are fantastic places to put data. You should put your data in the US because it'll be totally safe. <laughs> so so I, you, know, you should put it in the UK because it's totally safe. So I, so I would just, and not to say that it, this doesn't negate any of the work that needs to be done. You can need to continue doing that work, but it just gives you an idea of the complexity of it, that even when you hit upon the safe space that there will be developments that that prove that wrong. And I and I do think um, number one there are other factors that go into that decision making. Um, it's not just where data is safe, and this goes to the counterbalance of the other interests of the company, which may not be completely aligned with the user. Which is why, like I kind of think through that process and how to provide more incentives for a company to think through yeah, tax is something that impacts a lot of, you know, what jurisdictions companies, you know, affiliate with established entities in or put servers in. Um, and um, that's even true in the United States itself. Um, and there's a lot of other elements that feed into that structure. And latency so latency is another thing too. Latency, so, like how many undersea cables are there and where does the where do the packets of data need to travel to to get to your users, and what are you doing if you're a Netflix, which is providing very, you know, high density, you know, information to its users? You're going to want your servers as close as possible to your user base. Whereas if you're just providing textual information, maybe you can place it further away and it'll be fine. So and and deal with some of those jurisdictional issues. 
Um, I also say, you know, countries are equally looking at the developments and what tech companies are choosing to do strategically to deal with these issues. So they are changing their laws and they are proactively, it's kind of a, a cat and mouse thing. So I think that collaboration, I think, you know, maybe, um, and also doing, you know, policy building and things like that as maybe not stage one, understanding like so only can do so much at certain stages in the company's development, but down the line, um, I know both Yahoo and Endurance have been involved in also, um, you know, lobbying, lobbying and, and doing that type of work as well to ensure that the laws are thinking about these these issues and also working with civil society and advocacy groups to kind of see where the tensions lie and where interests align, where they don't, and how to manage that balance very realistically and, and pragmatically. Okay, that's just sort of moderate question then. I'm just picking up on this sort of you know, what's stage one issue? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, but also what, how, building capacity from the very early stages, because we have a spectrum from companies that may be one or two people to companies that have robust business and human rights programs. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, the one or two people, you know, the term human rights may be foreign, but mm -hmm. they still have to build capacity to deal with law enforcement. And, and uh, I'd be curious if Jane and Bella and anyone on the panel, just those early stage, you know, you're not a human rights expert, but you need to build capacity to address these questions and what recommendations you might have. Yeah, I, I, um, I think certainly we uh, have grown and learned about it through that because of our, as I said, was a former startup. And we've also acquired a number of smaller companies that um, are you know, also startups. And they're all run by young entrepreneurs who they're thinking about their product and they're thinking, you know, I, I know our CEO, um, our entire platform was based on the open source, and so one of his values was giving back, and we contributed to Code to America. And so that's sort of his angle on things, and he just doesn't, just because there's so much going on, it's, um, you know, I think the human rights thing has sort of come up from from behind. And I do think, I want to echo what Vivek said about it important, being important to have values, and we recently took the leap of, okay, we're going to, put our policies out there, like what, what do we stand for? And they're on our website and you know, we've kind of just simplified them, like you know, we're not the divorce court, if you have an ownership dispute, go get a court order. We're not the judge and jury, we don't take down content for allegations of defamation, go get a court order. Um, so things like that, and it can really, if you just sit down and think about them, think about what your values are. So career CEO in 2012, um, said to David the job council and I, hey, can you guys um, provide your services, your legal services, in a way that makes the web a better place? And so out of that comment has really grown um, this whole web civility idea that, that endurance is now involved in. Um, but posting your policies up there really gives you something to fall back on for the hard cases, because it's something you can point to and say, look, th this is what we stand for. And it's really helped, like with law enforcement. We've had just the other day, I had somebody contact us and say, hey, we see on your website that you say you won't give customer contact without a warrant, would you take a court order or, you know, and so that started this discussion. And drawing a line in the sand helps, because then they know, like now the FBI knows, the, whatever the law enforcement knows, you need warrant for content um, or you're just not going to get it. So it could be a little yeah. eye of the left first, but it really helps. I, I think uh, the communication piece is, is key. It's really communicated to your user base in a very accessible fashion, which is easier said than done. Um, what, how you address these issues, um, you know, there's a balance between opening up the, the sausage making plan and you definitely is probably not that beneficial to do that, but, you know, actually saying that there's a process, saying, you know, and understanding that internally as well, and then, you know, leveraging your internal capacity. You don't know, especially in the tech world, you've got a young kid who's doing all the coding and, and you know, for whatever reason is super interested in encryption technology. You know, think about, you know, tapping into the resources of your own employee base and also, you um, Onboarding, I think, is a key element of this as well to ensure that these values are shared throughout the company and 
you know, that everybody in the chain understands, at least when a request comes in, hold up, don't answer, talk to the CEO, have a lawyer or somebody around that you can call, even, you know, even if it's like, okay, I have enough money for 10 minutes, so <laughs> this is it, you know, like, please keep it short because you know I'm, you're going to bankrupt me if you're a fancy lawyer, and, you know, stuff like that, I think it's important, to, and that's why it's part of threading it into the larger business model and strategy and thinking about these things, and then, you know, one of the challenges is you never know if you're going to get that that person in Syria who suddenly uses your technology. You didn't, you weren't thinking of your technology to be used that way. So thinking about what you think your platform should be utilized as and then thinking about the potential alternative uses. Um, so at the very least, you can somewhat anticipate what could happen despite their not, you'll never anticipate everything to develop this point, but at least thinking through those elements so that you at least have a response or have someone to, to ask. I would say um, a human rights risk impact assessment. So, and this is something if you're a very small company, you may not have the resources to do it. And this is where I mean, if you don't have, um, there aren't actually very many, except for full. I mean, there are like who can do it, but I think this is where engaging with other older companies and then also with NGOs to help you figure out where your areas of vulnerability are. So I think figuring out what are the risks that are specific to my business and focusing there. Um, also being very uh, focused in how you address them. So um, for example, there is um, an initiative around encryption. Obviously, I think we've all heard about that. And so Tumblr, you know, Tumblr was asked, and what Tumblr said is, look, our platform is public. It is a completely public, everything is out there. We don't allow, there's no sort of private. So it doesn't make any sense for us to do this. So being very clear about tailoring whatever your response is to your actual human rights risk. And I think the point that you made to you about notice is really important. Look, every platform is not for every user. There are some platforms that do not make sense if you are an activist. So for example, if you are someone who needs a certain level of anonymity, a platform that requires you to use your real name may not make sense. It doesn't necessarily mean the platform has to change. What it means for the platform, what it means for the platform is that the platform has to give enough information to users so that they can make an informed decision about how they interact with the platform. So if your policies are such that you, for example, are subject to Chinese law, you need to make that very clear to users. And it's a challenge, and I say that as someone who's on this end, because you know you put as much as possible in terms of service because you want to cover all eventualities. And so it's 100 pages long, and I have never read a term of service, and I do this. Like, this is my job. So, so most people aren't going to read a term of service, so I would say that it continues to be a challenge about how to inform users in a way that where they can make an informed decision. But I don't, and I, think, and I, I do want to make it very clear that I think, I, don't, I do not think that every commercial platform must be shaped to the uses of everyone. You never know how people are going to interact with your platform. You can create something you think is awesome for taking pictures of, I don't know, cats, and people use it. For, for, for uses that you did not anticipate, the key there is to is, is, is to give them appropriate notice so that they can make the decision. And and think about especially early stage companies can, you know, in terms of service, we're trying to fill a legal gap early on, and, and they still somewhat do that. Um, but think about how to communicate to your users. That's not that's not the only mechanism available to communicate. There's you know, there's a lot of ways, and I think that's, that's actually, young companies can really yeah. experiment in that space, and I think I, I welcome and challenge, and I, I constantly challenge my, my tiny little client, my, I challenge my students and my clients to really think through that, and I, I feel like... Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. You had a question. I want to dig a little bit more into the jurisdictional and architecture question, um, especially with regards to the implications of virtualization. <laughs> and CDNs and sort of other systems that kind of take it out of the, the question of where your server is, mm -hmm. even if you do need to have sort of access nodes all over the world. It's, so CDNs are an interesting element because technically most organizations, some have their own CDN networks, in which case they are placing nodes around the world and they're pushing data around just so people know what CDNs are. Just, just explain them. Yeah. Just, just, it's, it's, it's essentially a way, it's, it creates a network of, of kind of virtual servers that put, that cache information closer to the user so that it doesn't have to go back all the way home 
to get that information. So if you were accessing a website yesterday, the closest node to you will cache that information so the following day you get it as quickly or quicker because it's suddenly resting on a server. Um, you know, the largest CN provider in the United States is Akamai, um, and they have a very robust CN network, um, and many companies use them um, to essentially reinforce the speed and latency of their network. So as far as the jurisdictional questions and whether that creates jurisdiction over a company, I hate to say this, but it really depends on the laws of the country. Um, if you read Athenai's China Rider, it's actually one of the scariest things I've ever read in my life because they have a completely separate writer. They're not actually licensed to do business in China. They use CDN providers that are in China. And if you sign up to use their CDN service in China, anything that you cache via that provider and any data about that user that goes to that cache is subject to the jurisdiction of the Chinese government and big capital letters across the top. So at least they're making it yeah. very, very clear yeah. and transparent. Yeah. Right. And but they, they are, are and all the other CDN providers, and that's an interesting question. Well, I don't know, but Akamai <laughs> makes it very clear to the person that they're providing CDN services to. Now, whether the user, the end user, is aware is a whole different story. Right. Isn't it really them that yeah. needs to be aware and that their is, data is being This is a huge China. challenge for early stage companies because these are companies that are basically taking whatever terms of service are, are, <laughs> are offered to them by cloud providers or CDS or, or whatever, right? Um, and they have very little leverage in that relationship and they're probably not savvy enough to detect mm -hmm. where the pain points are uh, looking down, you know, looking down the turnpike. One of the things that, you know, internally as we're putting this together, we're just sort of thinking about it, is how do you start to advise, you know, a company saying, okay, where should I store my data? Like, like which provider do I use? And how do you even know where your provider is banked, right? What physical locations are they using, right? Um, it's just a very, very complicated issue. And I think different governments are just also have different, you know, at this point, different theories of yours. You know, you know, different <laughs> theories of jurisdiction, right? The idea of Belgium saying, well, if our service is available, we have jurisdiction over you. It's an extreme view, but I think a lot of governments are going to move towards that, right? Uh, there's a countervailing movement that says, if you're going to offer services in our jurisdiction, you must be here physically, right? Uh, which is happening post Snowden, right? Yeah. Yeah. Brazil says, you know, if you, if Google, Yahoo, if you want to uh, offer your service to Brazilians, you've got to be here. Right. Um. And there's, I mean, and, and third party service is a whole other animal, especially for an early stage company that is likely relying on third parties. Um, you may not have the negotiating power. Your, you know, economic power is key when you're negotiating these contracts. So, but due diligence questions, ask them. And, you know, something that we, you know, it's not yet in the guide, but maybe next phase or next stage is to help provide those questions, you know, what, you know, along with service levels and technical infrastructure and everything like that, you know, what what data center will I be located located at, you know, you know, and these these also feed into very practical questions about redundancy and, and reinforcing your network and you know diversifying so that you don't go down, which is key for an online service provider, but also it feeds into those jurisdictional questions. And if, let's say you only know the law of California, you have a California lawyer and you know the law of California, and maybe your California law has also told you a little bit about Virginia, let's say, because those are big nodes, tech, you know, data center nodes in this country. Um, you know, talk to your service provider. Can you place me there? Because I get that, but I don't get it, you know. And, at least you can ask questions that help you mitigate despite the terms of the contract being very imbalanced, frankly, to be really honest. Um, I was thinking about, because I haven't seen any sort of transparency reporting coming out of like the Amazon Web Services yeah. type of yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so this has been a really big issue that I've been curious about because so many folks, you know, you might issue a transparency report about the data requests that come to you. But if your platform is based on AWS, and AWS receives direct requests for data, I mean, I don't know whether they do or whether they don't, because they're not issuing a transparency report. And most of you know the small startup type 
providers are sitting on AWS. Does anybody well, know anything so, about that? No, because that's not something we would deal with, but one of the things that we have, and, and again, we're a different company, we're a different size, right. but we'll have specific provisions around who gets to respond to law enforcement. And so right. we will say, if it's Yahoo data, it has to come to us. You cannot respond. But here's the thing. If, if a company is in a jurisdiction where they have to respond or right. and they get a, job, they get a secret request order. and they have to they respond and they can't tell us about it, we have no control over that. Right. I think that's why these conversations have to, have to recognize the policy piece. They have to recognize that this is an issue of governance, that I think there's a ton of stuff that companies can and should do, but to the extent that people really want to drive change, this is a conversation where governments need to be in the <coughs> Isn't the first stage of driving that change making the policy kind of like easier to identify at the early stage? I think like, that's, the, that's the part that I mean. When you say policy, policy I just mean like how do we identify, like, yeah, basically. There's a whole bunch of, I mean, the guide I think is one, right? And I think obviously a lot of work that you do is aimed at that. But I think Yahoo probably, as much as anybody, has done a huge amount of this. We do. Right? So that's why we had a user first event uh, that's, that was focused at early stage companies. We're doing another one in Miami. I mean, part of the thing is like, this is what we do because we're passionate about it, but it's not actually our business. Um, so, so, so this is where I think organizations like Global Network Initiative and, and Berkman Center and Foley, I mean, you know, but I mean, I think Foley is doing a ton of um, sort of pro bono work helping um, organizations, and so we have partnered with organizations, and that's one of the reasons why I talk everywhere about all this, you know, about all the things companies can and should do. But I don't know that um, I don't know that we as companies can be the only platform for this kind of thing. And this is where I think multi-stakeholder. I keep saying it, GNI, multi-stakeholder engagement is critically important. And and wearing my external, not at a company hat. You know, appreciate all the work that companies are doing, but also, you know, not to divorce citizenry from their government any further, which is already happening by just the nature of how the internet has been structured. Um, you know, this is also something of tapping into the larger community and advocacy groups and civil society that can provide a different perspective than companies. Um, companies provide one perspective, and it's a very valuable and practical perspective, and I think for a young company, invaluable to make those connections um, and seeing where you can engage, but also reaching out to other places um, and not, you know, something that I took, I, I get this all the time when company comes and I, I took so-and-so's terms of use, here, I can post it, right? And I'm like, well, hold on a second, your service is different, you know, <laughs> you do different things, like this is very basic, right? And it happens all the time, you know, lawyers who aren't experienced in this space even do it occasionally, I mean, with some more nuance. Um, but, so thinking about it that way as well, it's about being, critical and thinking about what your needs are and then tapping in to whatever resources are out there. There are going to be companies like Amazon who frankly are unlikely, at least at this stage, because of the way their culture is, you know, to provide that. But understanding that on the front end, you know, asking that question to your salesperson, they're not going to know the answer most likely, but asking, you know, there's this whole Snowden thing. Um, you know, how do you handle that? Or do you talk to me or whatever? And then maybe you can notify your users about if you do end up publishing a transparency report, um, you know, you can then notify, you know, this only is represents the request that we have gotten. We have third party service providers that may or may not publish transparency reports. And unfortunately we are not privy to that information. And just being honest about it, there's you can only do what you can do. And I think we shouldn't, you know, I think customers and users really actually are willing to engage in that conversation and, and would prefer that than being surprised. I'm gonna do, can I just put on my own, my own, because I'm turning 40 in two weeks and I'm feeling like I'm, I'm a grown up now. <laughs> so, here's, so here's my, um, here's my civics teacher thing. All of these, we're talking about policy. Every, you are citizens. It is not, you do not, you have not elected the company to speak for you. No matter what service you use, that, company, that service is not your voice. All of these issues are policy issues. It is your duty as a citizen to be informed and it is your duty to take part in the political process. 
I cannot tell you how many people, particularly in this world, say, I'm in tech, you know, politics, it's just too much, it's not my, it's not my problem. And this elected official is just the same as that elected official. You can take that point of view, but the decisions that they are making are having a direct impact on your life. And to the extent that you remain unengaged, you cannot then complain. I'm not saying anyone in this room is that, is, is that way, but I'm saying I've had enough conversations in this field where people feel like this is not my business, this is why I don't engage. And problems like this is why it is important to engage. I would say too, that, oh, sorry, um, just you know, being at a company where we don't have a wonderful human <laughs> rights expert, um, what we found really helpful is is joining some trade organizations that share our common values. So, for example, we're part of a young organization called the Internet Infrastructure Coalition that formed out of. Um, SOPA in defeating that bill and others out of their work in defeating SOPA realize that there is a real gap of um, there isn't enough representation of internet infrastructure providers in Washington DC. And so it's been, we've really gotten a lot out of that partnership because we've met other companies like ours um, who might have thought about policy issues from a different perspective than we have. And it also helps, like, I'm actually heading to D.C. tomorrow to meet with um, congressional and Senate offices and their staff and to try to push for reform in issues that affect our customers. So, you know, particularly like ACLA reform or mm -hmm. patent reform um, or support of the, the, the um, Freedom Act or Patriot Act. Um, so I think that it's really helpful if you do have a lack of resources to find organizations out there that might share your common interests and, and common values. Mm -hmm. There's a question, I know you were waiting in the back row, or did you have a Oh, sorry, yes. Um, I was wondering if, there, if anybody has a due diligence checklist for stuff like this that they'd be willing to share. Um, or On a one-to-one -one basis, yes. Okay. Yeah, so it's not something we would put on that. Webs, but certainly, and they said that you're interested. I would be happy. Awesome. To and even even just the the human yeah. rights section of the DIA, I, I think I'm sure sharing it would be helpful. Another really good resource was the EFF. Anybody ever used to see the EFF boot camps? The, I don't know if they run them anymore, but their materials are still online. And if you go and just Google EFF boot camp, they've got a whole series of courses that they put together for people that you know for startups, you know, issues that they need to consider. And while they might be a few years out of date, things haven't changed all that much. So, I mean, to some extent, we've been talking about the easy issue when we're talking about government and privacy and fighting back against that. What there was an issue that was adverted to earlier about, you know, rights of vulnerable groups and when there might be conflict there, in terms of a process to go through and your diligence in resolving this is the boundary. This is where we prioritize freedom of expression over protecting whether it is a security right of women or children, what have you. What, have you got a process in place to resolve those kinds of issues when it's not the government that's coming in, but when there are internationally recognized human rights that may you know, suffer, there might be adverse impacts? Do you make specific uh, So right now, the ITU and UNICEF came out with the children's principles for you know, the ICT sector. They're awful. But uh, they, they do deal with a lot of, they lay out uh, in, in some moderate depth the types of things that ICT companies should be thinking about depending on what's, what element of the process they're involved in. But they talk about inappropriate content for my instances. And there's some duty, it's certainly you know, uh, the easiest one. And so let's go to sort of the clear evil in this space, child pornography. Now, as you know, as the distributor of content, well, how do you reconcile your roles with distributing content that, you know, in the United States it might be easy to reconcile it, but in other places it may not necessarily be easy to reconcile it where freedom of expression as a right comes up across against other rights, harms that may be suffered by particular groups. What it's, you know, obviously there's no one answer, of course they're still wrestling with this, but what is the process you go through? Is there a particular set process to identify impacts beyond privacy? Yeah, so a couple things. One, I, I would like to highlight this question as an example of the compl complex situation that companies are in. So on the one hand, we have people saying, you should not have all of this on your, on your platforms. I'm not talking about child pornography, because I think we all agree when it comes to child pornography. I think we're talking, we're and talking the about that. Yeah, the law said it's not whether you know, a company believes it's right. wrong or right. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's 
a matter of law. But I think recognizing that um, the decisions are made in the gray areas where, and we have a huge amount of pull on either on either end. So if you're talking about content, I can only speak for my company because I think different companies have, have different policies. We um, value free, freedom of expression. We also do not want to live in a world if we're not talking about specific um, sp specific laws against certain types of content. We value living in a world where number one platforms um, are not um, do not have liability do not have the liability for things that users are posting. Because when you do that, you, you definitely chill speech. Because then you have platforms saying, "I'm going to be legal, legally liable for content that is not illegal, but maybe in content that people don't like." Then I'm in a position where I'm not going to put in anything on there. And if you're talking about uh, content specific to minors, I think this is where you have to be a little bit more specific. In the Yahoo case, we will take down content that is against the law in that particular jurisdiction. That span that spans a large range. There's also a, a, a cat, there's also a category of content and information that um, the, that is against the terms of service for other reasons because that particular platform, you know, for example, you know, you may have a uh, uh, I'll use Flickr because it's an interesting thing. So Flickr was created to be about oh we have a here. Flickr was created to be about original photographs. It wasn't supposed to be like a photo bucket where you put in you know your, your favorite people pictures of Justin Bieber. That is that has nothing to do with the law, but that's about what the platform is for. The other point about Flickr is that if you wanted to put up adult content, it had to be flagged adult content. But there are people who took issue with that because they felt that why should, why should I have to flag my content? If it's flagged, then not everyone can see it. So I think I'm just saying this to demonstrate some of the, the complex situations that companies are in, and also that companies, depending on your audience, depending on your platform, depending on where it is that you are, the, the markets that you target, will have different rules. Certainly, when we do human rights impact assessment, we're assessing a wide range of a wide variety of rights. We will focus more specifically on privacy and free expression because those are the rights that are most impacted by our business. But when I do human rights impact assessment, I look at rights of minorities, I look at rights of sexual minorities, I look at rights of women, I look at rights of children to really identify the specific risks that are presented by that particular product, by that particular platform. If you're talking about an early stage company, the, their ability to do the type of analysis that we're able to do at Yahoo, I think, is is slightly limited. Um, I mean, and I think anyone who's <laughs> can say that. Um, I mean, I know that that's what we do, but I, I wouldn't hold that out as something that an early stage company has the capacity to do. And so, in that case, it will make sense to say, what is my product? Who is my market? Um, who, and 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 what are the laws the, that are relevant to this particular content? And 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 sticking with that. Can I just ask you a follow-up on that? Just in that process, do you have set definitions of this is what cause or contribute to means, and this is what directly linked to means, and this is the scope of what we'll look at? For, sorry, under the five principles, the, the links that establish the adverse impacts for which a company should to which a company should pay attention. And I'm sorry, I don't understand. Oh, sorry. The, in the guiding principles on business and human rights, there. No, I know that part, but I don't understand your question. So, what? so the causal terms, mm -hmm. cause or contribute to or directly linked to, mm -hmm. when you're doing your human rights impact assessment, do you have definitions of those terms that you use to understand whether something is directly linked to or whether you're actually causing or contributing to? Yes, but I think if we step back, let's, let's think about the issues that we're actually talking about. So two things. One, as a company, under the guiding principles, it is not our responsibility. It is our responsibility to respect human rights. It's not our responsibility to, uh, to protect human rights. So that's the responsibility of states. So that's one. But we, certainly within those contexts where human rights impact assessments, are looking at the extent to which privacy and free expression and all of these other particular human rights. We can't look at all of them. We cannot look at, at the panoply of, of potential rights and see what, what all of those impacts are. And so necessarily, in order to be the most effective, we have to focus in on the rights that are most relevant to us. So yes, in the context of our human rights impact assessment, we have definitions that make sense for us. I, I also think, and I'm actually curious what Jane thinks about this, because she has, you know, they have different brands, but I think this goes back to the values of the company and what you're communicating to the user base, because there are technologies that, frankly, probably sh are not best utilized for a certain use case. You know, if, you know, I think someone yesterday at the panel brought up anonymity in Facebook. That's not, or let's use another one, LinkedIn, right? There's a reason that real names exist on that platform because of what that network is trying to do. And so maybe that's not the place to speak if 
you really want to be anonymous because you're really, you know, fighting the f good fight against some very <coughs> oppressive regime or something like that. Maybe there's another tool that exists out there, and thankfully we're in a in an environment now that there's many tools now available in the past that may not have been the case. Um, so I think that is about communicating and very, and even thinking about if you think that there's a risk or you've identified a risk and you don't know how to work around it without compromising another thing that frankly might be more aligned with what your company is doing, put it out there, you know? And, you know, there's a, you know, the internet is, and I get to speak very naively and high in the sky and idealistically because of where I'm situated, but, you know, link to another service that might provide that mechanism, create that, <coughs> that I, I'm going to use the word, because I'm in California, the synergy, you know, like, you know, think about those partnerships. It, it, it mitigates risks for both parties, and it actually reinforces the platform for their intended use case. So I think, um, you know, those are decisions that companies need to make themselves, but tapping into the network as an internet provider, I think, is one of the benefits of such a collab, like, I would say more than any other industry that I have personally worked with, it's one of the more collaborative spaces that exist. Other questions? Yeah, I, I think too with, with us, so we're maybe a little bit different from some of the other companies in that we have, because we're providing a service, web hosting or domain name, we have I think like 1,500 agents across the country who talk to our customers every day. And so for us, and for me, from a legal perspective, um, training is really important, so I make sure to get out to our uh, all our different call centers and talk to the support staff there and talk to them. We have this legal aspects of the web law <laughs> training that we give, but even more important, I found when we get out of these visits is the feedback from the support agents because they're our front line. And so if there are unintended uses, then we hear about them and then we can think about how to build them into our policy. Um, and as well, last year I founded internally a, a group called TAP, which is a Think About Policy group at Endurance. Um, and it's just an internal group. Most of it's done over the company's intranet. But it's a really nice way for us to link with our different, um, our different offices around the country, as well as the engineers that work with us, the lawyers, the support staff, who all have really different perspectives. And our people are actually really passionate about these user rights issues. Like our Bluehost brand is based out of Utah, and and then our HostGator is based in Texas. And there's like really serious liber libertarians. Like if it's not illegal, it does not come down. Mm -hmm. And we have to balance that. Adult content is one where HostGator has a different policy from Bluehost because HostGator says if it's not illegal, don't take it down. And Bluehost, I think it might actually be a Utah law. I don't know if it's still in fact that you can't pornography on your servers. So then we have one company with very different policies and, um, and so we think about it in the top group, like, uh, is that okay? Can we have two different policies and be one company? You know, and I think, from my personal perspective, I think it's okay, but then there are certain policies that need to be enterprise-wide, like um, OFAC, you know, you can't provide services to someone in Celia where a paid service, we could do domain name registration. Um, so, but, but from a human rights, I think there are still things that companies can do, so the escalation process is important because even with OFAP, for example, we had to shut down the website of um, an Iranian citizen journalist and they came back and they explained to us who they were and the State Department got involved and so we had to still suspend it as a matter of federal law, but we were able to write to OFAP and got a specific license to host <coughs> and provide domain registration services. So I think that the, the communication within your company can be really important and valuable. Just to pick up on Jane's point, I think pushback is a really important and underrated tool that every company has. I mean, simply asking the question of why, or under what, you know, what legal authority you're, you're doing this, is a very powerful question. And early stage companies may not directly have the resources to mount legal challenges. Right, but when companies do mount legal challenges, they can be very, very effective. I think. I would say you don't even have to, often you don't even have to get to the level of yeah. legal. Sometimes right. it just you get something from you know a sheriff in Butte, 
and, and, and they say, we want X, and you say, well, do you have the jurisdiction for X? And they go away, because right. they don't have it. Right. Right. So I think just being able to ask the question of, wait, wait a minute, this thing that you're asking for, do you do? or they call you, and you say, wait a minute, we only accept it in writing. And that's not to take away from, right. from the real, you know, uh, corporate social responsibility of being, you know, a corporate citizen and wanting, you know, to do your part. But to the extent that that person has not followed due process, ask the question. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I totally agree with that. And just the simple pushback of, you know, explain to me why can, you know, result in a certain percentage of these requests dropping off. And we see that powerfully in some of the transparency data. Yeah. If you look at request received, translating to, you know, information going out, you know, there's a huge funnel yeah. right, right there, yeah. uh, which is quite interesting. But I mean, what I was going to just point to is um, when, when the radar says something uh, is, is out of the sort. I mean, the advocacy organizations and, and the kind of public interest law groups like EFF and others do really effective work, I think, in holding government to account and challenging things. And sometimes, you know, finding laws are, that are to be unconstitutional, which is quite an achievement when you think about it. I, I also think, um, you know, as an individual startup, you may feel powerless or hemmed in, but you are in a community of little startups who are grappling with the same issues. So mm -hmm. there's market power there. Mm -hmm. And if everyone starts asking the same questions, I mean, as much as I, you know, when I talk to just friends about the internet and they call me, they're like, oh my God, Target, what do I do? Do I stop shopping? And I'm like, well, that's your choice, yes. But think about how you shop, things like that, all that kind of stuff. But what I call proactive consumerism, you, you as, a, as a citizen being a proactive citizen, as a consumer being a proactive consumer, and as a company, you are also a consumer, and you are also a citizen, too, what Abella was saying before. So it's OK if law enforcement calls you and be like, OK. If you were knocking down my door, like as an individual, I would be like, hold up. <laughs> Where is your warrant, right? I wouldn't just let law enforcement in, necessarily. And, Thinking about that, just as an like, where is your tension point? Especially, let's say you are the only employee, you are the CEO, you just started this. I mean, at that <coughs> level, and then translating those values out and within, I think, as you grow and threading it into the culture of, you know, it, you, Google did it with the good, not evil thing. I'm still not clear what that means, but, but thinking about what are your axioms? What, what do you want? Your company to stand for, and I think that might help. I think that point is so important because I think one of the biggest mistakes I see small companies make, and it was one that Yahoo made back in its earliest days, which was, um, you know, somebody shows up with a subpoena and it looks very official, and it's somebody telling you that they need to turn over data, and um, you might not realize that that level of process doesn't mean.